This is Wednesday, December 20th, I think. Yes. And uh, my name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Wednesday night Bible study. We were in the book of Luke, uh, where um, we are seeing the story of Christ and his ministry through the eyes of a, of a Gentile. Um, this was written... We think during the time period that Paul was on trial for defending Christ. Um, and so he's charting out for Paul, for the either the attorney or the judge, because it's O Theopolis, O Honorable Theopolis, he was either the attorney or the judge. Um, here's the story of Christ, and then, and then Luke continues in book, act in the book of acts to make the case and then paul converted and began to preach the story and basically he's in prison to this day for doing this thing but here's all the evidence i've got all these witnesses and that's what it's full of it's full of witnesses here's the story here's exactly what happened and um you make your own decision basically he's saying because in the book of acts we stopped with paul in prison um and i guess i guess he handed him luke and acts to the judge or the lawyer and well we know what happened later but the book of acts ends there with paul in prison uh, paul was set free and then shortly thereafter uh because paul's in prison in rome sh shortly thereafter the Romans come and invade Jerusalem and destroy it. Um, and everything that Jesus was predicting was going to happen, happens. So after, Paul, uh, after Luke has introduced the parents of Jesus and the parents of John the Baptist, then we meet them as adults. We see them as babies. Now we meet them as adults. And John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus in the, uh, near the Jordan River. And uh, it says that the Spirit of God, well, let's start from Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It says, after Jesus was baptized, it says, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm stopping with this phrase. Uh, in John chapter 3, verse 34, it says, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Why do we know that? He says, for God does not give the Spirit to him by measure. He, he, he doesn't measure it out. He's got the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't give it to him by measure. And, you know, we use a measuring cup to, okay, I want two teaspoons of this, and I want a pint of this, and I want four of that. We measure things out. We have a measure of the Holy Spirit. Um, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. We each have, everyone's got a measure of faith. But in John, he said, Jesus has the Spirit without measure. There, he didn't give it to him by measure. He's filled, he's full. So God, all of God came inside of Jesus and embodied him. He doesn't have a measure of it. So when he speaks the word of God, it's God talking to us. We don't have to worry that he only got a little part of it. Uh, uh, even in Corinthians, Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. We don't see the whole picture. We see through like a looking glass that's kind of fuzzy. So we get a part of God. We think we heard God. We, and then we move out on faith. That's not how Jesus, like God was just speaking right through him because he was God inside of man and so you got to listen to his words and listen to his, his actions so anyway Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit we turned from the Jordan this is Luke 4 1 and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness so he wants to make clear that you know this Spirit of God was leading him now I'm, I'm gonna camp there uh, because it's afraid he was led by the Spirit Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And Paul is making distinction between those who are led by the devil and led by God. 
are those who are led by the world and those who are led by God. So those who are being led by God, God is your main source. He's your goal. He's who you, that you're trying to please. Those are the sons of God. Just like um, uh, in those days, a child would imitate his father. His father's a carpenter, and he becomes a carpenter. Like Jesus becomes a carpenter. You're, you're following your father's footsteps. And so if you're following your father's footsteps, that's who we, we can tell whose son you are, whose daughter you are. Um, so those who are led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. Those who are led by the world, you're a son of the world. Now, this is the distinction that the Bible has made from the beginning, from Genesis. Those who are led by the Spirit, who are the sons, those are called the sons of God. And those who are led by the world, and you call the son of the world, or the son of man. Um, for as many as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, in Genesis chapter 5, in the first, in, in chapter 5 of Genesis, he's dividing the sons of Adam into those who are the sons of God and those who are sons of man, meaning those who are led by God and those who are led by man. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21, after he said, and Adam begat Seth, and Seth began this person and begat that person. Genesis 5, verse 21 says, and Enoch lived 65 years and he begat Methuselah. We've all heard of Methuselah, who's a long living man. It says, and after he begat Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. So he's a son of God because he's being led by God. He, he walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. And so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, normally at this point, it was says, and then he died. It says, and he died not. He was not dead, for God took him. So his walk, he just like walked right on into heaven. So Enoch comes from the line of Seth. You got Seth's kids and you got Cain's, Cain, Cain's kids, right? I'm going to mention another person. Enoch begat somebody, and they begat blah, 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 and then Lamech was born. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 28, it says, Lamech lived 182 years and he had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, this one, he had a vision from God, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So somehow the curse will be slightly relieved. The ground was cursed, but this one will allow us to rest. In fact, his name Noah means rest because he, he's somehow going to bridge this gap. God, God is angry with us and we're working our butts off here. The land's been cursed because of, it was started with Adam, but he'll bring some sort of rest for that, which Noah did. There's a Noah a covenant that God made with Noah after the flood. And so he says, you, you can rest from worrying that God's going to destroy the earth with a flood. I'm making my covenant with man, and he made this covenant with Noah. So Lemech had a vision, and this is directly, this is the line of Seth. Seth had all the godly people who who were led by the Spirit of God. So they're called, they're the sons of God. They walked with God. If you're led by the Spirit of God, you're a son of God. That's what it says. Now, we hear, uh, oh, in fact, Genesis uh, 6, 9 says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Um, Noah was a just man. He was perfect and right in, in his generations. Noah walked with God. So you had Enoch, you had Lamech, you had Noah. They all walked with God from Seth's godly line. Now, here's Cain's line. Uh, and in Genesis chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. So Seth and them, Seth and his kids, they all followed the presence of the Lord, and they all walked with God. And Enoch and Lamech and Noah, they were righteous. They're the sons of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. But Cain went out of the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Genesis chapter 4, verse 17 says, Cain knew his wife, she conceived, and she bore Enoch. So she, they didn't, they were not original with names. So there's another Enoch that came from the line of Cain, but he built a city, Cain built a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. I'm going to call this, the, and, and, and it was an attempt to establish your own government away from God. It says, Cain walked out of the presence of God. We're going to govern ourselves. They can follow God. They're the sons of God. We're the sons of men because we are following after men. 
and the Bible's making a distinction. See how these were godly people? Well, look at this group. Verse 18, it says, to Enoch and Melith, like kids and grandkids and great grandkids, Enoch was born Irad, and Irad was Mechedjuel, and Mechedjuel begat Methushael, and Methushael begat Lemech. And this is another Lemech, but this is from the line of Cain. Now remember the, from Seth's line, Lemech gave birth to Noah and had a vision, and he's going to bring comfort to his people. Well, it's about this Lemech, who's from the other line that's following after men. Then Lemech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, the name of the second was Zilcha. In verse 23 of Genesis 4, then Lamech said to his two wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wise of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me. And even a young man, this is a different person, for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech 77fold. So you think Cain had it bad, and there were, I've killed twice as many people. Cain just killed one person, I've killed two, so I'm going to get. I'm 10 times as bad as, as Cain. And so this is, you've got the line of Cain where Lamech is boasting about the men he's killed. And you've got the line of Seth where the other Lamech in that line is saying, and I gave birth to Noah and he will bring comfort to us. And so you've got the godly line, the sons of God and what we would call the sons of men. Paul's making that distinction. Those who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. Those who are led by man are the sons of men, because that's who you're following. Genesis chapter 6, very first verse, emphasizes the distinction that was just made. Sons of men, sons of God. We just described two lines, Cain's kids who are killing people, Seth's kids who are trying to walk with God and following after God. Now it came to pass when man began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, now we were just talking about that godly line, saw the daughters of men. Now, the godly line with, with Enoch and Lamech and Noah and all the, they were staying within themselves and marrying within themselves. But as things spread out now, these, these two tribes that have been created that are opposite of each other are now running into each other. So the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives of themselves of all whom they chose. So he's saying, we started off in two separate groups. Seth's kids who were falling after God. Enoch loved God so much, walked with God so much that he just walked into heaven. Lamech gave birth to Noah, who we know God's gonna use Noah and this group. But by the time it came down to Noah and them, they had started to mix so you couldn't tell what was going on. The, the two tribes were mixing and they were, the sons of God were now giving into temptation, and you couldn't tell. They were acting just like the sons of men. Again, if you're a son of man, that means you're following after man. Man is your leader. Your sons of God means you're being led by the Spirit of God. Verse 5 of Genesis 6, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So it, Cain's side was winning. That's why he had to say, okay, that's it. You're just evil now. That side is winning. Now, even though if you're reading Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you see you've got Cain and how bad he is, and you've got Seth. I mean, Cain killed Abel, so Abel's not there, but Seth anymore. You can see that you've got two distinct groups. The sons of Cain, who are boasting, their Lamech is boasting about killing people. You've got the sons of Seth, who are boasting about how they're following after God. In Genesis 6, they mention these two groups, the sons of God, daughters of men, and how they then mix together. That's why evil spread. For some reason, people want to think that these sons of God are angels. And nowhere has, in, in six chapters, as anyone talking about angels? It's not come up at all. But they said, oh, these sons of God, this is when angels came down to the earth and started having sex with men. But that's made up. It, that's not who we've been, if we've read, and we did earlier, starting in 2020, we were reading through Genesis chapter by chapter. Nowhere are angels mentioned anywhere, just these two groups. 
Enoch and Lamech and Noah and the sons of God who are being led by the Spirit of God, and then the sons of Cain who are being led, who are, who are the sons of men. That's only two groups that have been mentioned, and now they're they're getting together, and there's no so people have made up a whole thing about angels have come down and they've created giants and not nope that's made up. We know who the two groups were, Seth and his group, and then he said, now Cain he had kids and they were horrible. They were killing people, but then they mixed together. So God has to say that's it. Now, uh, Jesus is going to be led by the spirit because he and he's a son of god that's why we know in matthew 4 verse 1 it says jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil um as a as a son of god and the devil that's one of the temptations if you are the son of god because you're being led by the spirit if you're a son of god turn these bit that's if you're a son of god that's because that's that's the distinction that the Bible writers were using. People follow after God. We call them sons of God. And Jesus was, had the spirit without measure. He was totally following after God. And then there's, you're following after men. You're either following after men or God. These are the two distinctions. Um, Jesus is now being led by the spirit to be tempted. So let's talk about that. Because you know, So being tempted for 40 days by the devil. Luke 4, verse 2 says the temptation lasted for 40 days. We only see what happened on the last day, but being tempted for 40 days by the devil. On the last day, here's what happened. So we don't know what all he was tempted of for 40 days, but there's something about the number 40 that I would just wanna major on because this is a huge theme in the Bible. Anyone reading it, during that time period when, oh, 40 days, I know what that means. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 17, it says, now the flood was on the earth for 40 days. So Noah, a son of God, he walked with God, so he's a son of God, warns everybody there's going to, God's going to bring judgment. Then God judged all those people and took them away, and Noah and his family is all that's left. In fact, later, should have referenced it later when Jesus talks about it. And in the days of Noah, there were some who were taken and some who were left. That taken is the people who were taken away through judgment. The water washed them away. Noah was left. We sometimes interpret that the opposite. Those who were taken, we think, are the good people were taken to heaven and everybody else was left. The bad people were left. But when Jesus gives that example, the ones who were taken were the bad people. Noah and his family were left. And this is going to be frustrating for some people because that's a scripture that they use for the rapture. And they say, see, God's going to take the Christians away. But in the days of Noah, Noah was left. It was the bad people were taken away. So you can't use that scripture for the rapture. Uh, anyway, Genesis 7, chapter 17. Now the flood was on the earth for 40 days. The water increased and lifted up the ark and it rose high above the earth. So Noah and his family, for 40 days, they're being tested. The people, they're wiped out on the first day. But Noah and his family are being tested for 40 days. That's a time of testing. They're in the ark. Are they going to hold on? Are they going to sin also? Are they going to curse God and be scared? And we hate you guys. Right, because people came in the wilderness uh as soon as they were thirsty you know it took them two days to be mad at god and curse god and god's ready to, to blow them up at that point are no one as people going to curse god and oh we're so scared and this is terrible and uh, or are they going to hold on to their faith in god 40 days so we know what that means in genesis chapter 8 verse 2 through 3 so it rained for 40 days Genesis chapter 8, verses 2 and 3 says, The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. So finally, after 40 days, all that stopped. Verse 3 says, And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the waters finally decreased. So for 
you could we get upset when it's rain. It's raining in L.A. today. If you can imagine the, the storm that was raining for forty days, we can't take four hours. Oh, the storm is here. Can you imagine forty days. That's a real test of their nerves. Is it ever going to stop? But it take a hundred and fifty days for the waters to decrease. Now, verse six of Genesis eight said, "So it came to pass." At the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Because finally the ark stopped at the very top of Mount Ararat. And for 40 days, they're just sitting on the top of Mount Ararat. So for 150 days, it took 150 days for the water to decrease. They're just floating. They're just floating, floating, floating. Finally, the ark stops at the top of Mount Ararat. And for 40 days, they're just waiting, 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 waiting. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And so that's another time of testing because the rain has stopped. The, the ark has stopped floating, floating, but it's just sitting. 40 days, they're waiting for some sign. They're waiting for something. They could have cursed. Another time, they could have cursed God. We hate you, God. Look what you did. Silence for 40 days. That's another time of testing. Finally, he opens the window, as we know, he sends out a raven, then he sends out a dove, and the dove. Um, and so when the dove appears on Jesus, right before this, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove. He, he was baptized by John. The dove came down. That's the same dove that came at the end of that 40-day period to let no one know, it's safe now. You can start to leave the ark. So there's two 40-day periods of testing, 40 days of rain and 40 days of just silence where they're just sitting in the ark. Still, it's no longer, it floated for 150 days as the rains were decreasing. Finally decreased enough that they could just rest on the mountain. So 40 days is symbolic of a time of testing your patience, right? God's not doing some incredible thing. You're just waiting it out. At the end of 40 days, do you curse God or not? In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 10, Here's another 40-day period that God talks about. Uh, I mean, yeah, 40-day period. Moses is up in the mountain, and he tells the people when he comes back, he says, as at the first time, just like the first time, I stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. The first time I went into the mountain, we just got to Mount Sinai. You saw God thundering. God gave the opportunity to talk to him. He says, no, Moses, we don't want to talk to God. He's too scary. You go talk to God. So I went up the mountain for 40 days. For 40 days, you had to just sit there in the silence. That was a time of testing. Can you just sit there? No, I cannot. It's been 40 days. I'm going to go out of my mind. Let's make a God and go back to Egypt. So it's... God puts people sometimes through those time periods of just silence to see, do you think I've gone on vacation? Are you going to give up on me? Oh, it's take, it took God too long. I'm going to do it my own way. Or can you wait things out? They couldn't. They, not all of them, but a lot of them said, no, we can't wait. We're going to go back to, go back to Egypt, the thing we've been complaining about. <sighs> but they couldn't, they couldn't take it. Can we take it if oh, God didn't answer my prayer right away? I give up. I hate God. Okay, I'm still God and I'm still here. Okay. So they, and, and, and he says, and as the first time I stayed in the mountain 40 days, because what happened, he did the second time he went up after he'd come down and they had sinned and Moses had lost his mind and broke the tablets and went great. And you, uh, right. Then he went back up for 40 days to pray that God does not destroy them. So this is a different 40-day period for them. Are we in trouble? Is God come back and destroy us? <laughs> right? It's a different 40-day period there. The, they see God. It's the lightning and the thundering, and they don't know. And when he comes back at the end of the second 40-day period is the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, and that established Yom Kippur for generations to come, for thousands of years to come, Yom, even today. They'll celebrate Yom Kippur, that Day of Atonement, but it happens at the end of that second 40-day period. So um, uh, it's a time of testing, right? But this time they repented at the end of their 40-day period, and they didn't go crazy and lose their mind. In 1 Kings chapter 19, 
verse 8, Elijah has just had this experience where he found out that uh, the woman, qu Queen oh, Jezebel, is mad at him and going to kill him. Now, he's just called down fire in the sky from the sky and done all this good stuff. But Jezebel apparently is scarier than God. And so he's running. Oh, she's after me. He says in, in, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went into the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb. So he went back. Horeb is the same mountain, Mount Sinai. Just one group calls it Horeb, another group calls it Sinai. But he ran all the way to Moses' mountain for 40 days. He's there in a cave, scared. But he's going there thinking, huh, I'll have the same protection as Moses had. And because I have the... And it says, so he's at the mountain of God in 1 Kings 19, verse 9. And there he was, he went into a cave and he spent the night in that place. And behold, the water of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Like, what's going on? Like, what, are you going to freak out? And that's a time of testing for Elijah. That 40-day period means it's a time of, and God didn't say anything for him for 40 days. Because God's thinking, you just called fire out of the sky burned you def I, you saw the the prophets of baal was defeated all these miracles have happened and you think i i've run out of miracles i've run out of power just be you i do i have to show up and and throw lightning and thunder and do all this stuff every single time you get panicked but sometimes that's what we demand of god we don't we don't think you know god just brought us through COVID and i made it god just brought me through this and i made it but, the next time, oh, my bill's due tomorrow, and I don't know if God's going to come through. I think God went on vacation. Maybe God is sick. And God's like, when can you just trust me? Do I have to do these phenomenal miracles all the time? Can there be periods of silence? Can there be periods? And, and because I'm still going to come through. That's Noah, you're in the ark. Moses, you're in the mount. <laughs> Moses is in the mount. And, and so these are times of testing, right, that, that we go through because God just simply wants to sh prove us and say, look, you held out. You didn't flip out. You didn't go crazy. And I came through. So some, when we don't hear from God, don't, we, we can't freak out. He hasn't gone anywhere. There's sometimes it's just silence. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. I'm still here. I'm going to come through. So they understood what the 40 days meant. In, chat, in, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, the spies had decided to go down and spy out the land and see if they believed that God was going to give them the land. Remember that the children of Israel had finally they'd come out of Egypt and they were, God was ready to send them to the land. And they said, hey, hey, before we go into that land, and if you read it in Deuteronomy's version of the events, you'll see clearly that they decided that they wanted to send spies and they prayed to God and God said, okay, go ahead. I've already told you I'm doing it. God's very for it. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, God, if I find uh, 30 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you not destroy it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Look, see if there's 30 people. God already knows what's going to happen. But okay, yeah, if you want to send spies. So they, for 40 days, and God didn't say a word, and they looked for 40 days, and then they came back and decided, ah, we don't believe God. So they failed their 40-day test. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, it says, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, you shall know my rejection. So you did not trust me for 40 days. You're trying to spy out the land to make sure I knew what I was talking about. For, and then came back and rejected me. You voted me off the island. Now nah, God doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay. So for every 40, every day you rejected me, I, you got 40 years punishment. And so 40 days is also related to 40 years. 40 years now becomes a type of punishment. 40 days is a type of testing to see, am I going to hold out and believe God? Or am I going to just, just uh, give up the boat? Ah, there's some phrase, buy the farm. I don't know what I mean. Anyway, am I going to give up on God? That's 40 day period because I'm not seeing an answer instantly. And the devil comes to me, Oh, God's not talking to you. God's rejected you. God's not answering your prayer. But then God's like, You know, I am going to answer the prayer, but, but I'm going to let the devil talk to you for 40 days. 
just to see if you're going to freak out. Like, who are you going to believe, me or the devil? I'm just curious because I've already told you what's going to happen. I've already given you my word, and now I'm going to see if you're just going to let the devil talk you out of it. But 40 years in the Bible became a type of punishment, a type of judgment. Uh, in fact, in Judges chapter 13, verse 1, it says, and again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered it into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So 40 years is punishment. Now, Jesus is going to explain to the Pharisees of his day about the judgment that's coming on them. They all know it's going to be a 40 year type of judgment for you, because that's how we judge the children of Israel in the wilderness. That's how I judge them when they were already in the land. And 40, year, 40 years is judgment. 40 days is testing. They knew the difference because they read the Bible. They had nothing else to read. So when they hear Jesus in the wilderness, 40 years, 40, 40 days. Oh, ooh, he's being tested. They already know what that means. Yeah, 40 days means testing. Judgment is coming. Uh oh, that means 40 years. They know the difference. Okay, in Luke chapter 20, Jesus gives this parable. This is for the end of his ministry. The temple's about to be thrown, uh, all this stuff's about to happen. Jesus is about to go to the cross, but he gives a warning to them. Luke chapter 20, verse 9. And I'm quoting from Luke because Luke is telling a specific story. Then he began to tell the people this parable. This is Luke 20, verse 9. A certain man planted a vineyard, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country for a long time. So here, you can have my vineyard. I'm leasing it to you, meaning you don't own it, but I'm letting you stay in this land. As long as you do what's right. Verse 10, now at vintage time, or at the season, at vintage time, right? He sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyards. Give me fruit of righteousness. And Jesus is using these as a metaphor, like Jesus sent his prophets. He wants now proof of their righteousness. So he sends a servant to the vine dressers that they may give him some fruit of the vineyard. Like loyalty, like love, give me some fruit. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty handed. Now, this is Jesus telling the story. And again, he sent a third and they wounded him also and cast him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what would the owner of the vineyard do to them? So he's giving, because they're, they're just moments away from killing Jesus. I'm the son of God. And so he gives this parable. I kept sending people. God kept sending people. To you, you know, you're just renters of this land. You don't own this land. I'm letting you stay in this land of Jerusalem, the stand of Israel. But when I send my son, surely they respect him. Nope, they didn't respect him, killed the son. So what will he do to them? He says, he will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. So I'm going to kick you off this land. God, God will kick you off this land of Israel. And I'm going to give it to others. And when they heard it, they said, certainly not. Like, that's not going to happen. God's not going to. But he's pronouncing judgment. Here's the judgment. Here's the punishment coming. And it's going to be a 40-year period when judgment comes. Everybody knows, oh, that's 40 years. Jesus is saying this in 30 AD. 40 years later, in 70 AD, they were kicked off the land. Now, when, Jesus, when God gave the punishment to the people who rejected what Moses said, Moses said, we're going to go into the land. And they said, nope, we're not going. Were they killed instantly? No, it was a 40-year period, and then they were gone. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 29, it says, The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. The, 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 kids, the kids don't get this punishment. The kids are believers. The kids will, but it's you people who think you know what you're talking about. I'm 20 years old and above, you are all going to die over a 40-year period. At the end of the 40-year period, you will be gone. Except Caleb, the son of Jephthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun, Yeshua. Yeshua gets to go in. Yeshua, 
Joshua, Yeshua, same name, the Hebrew version of the name. Jesus is the Greek version of Joshua. So Joshua, you get to go in and you're going to lead a new set of people. But all of these people who rejected Moses and what Moses said, they're all going to die, but not instantly. 40 year period that, you know, it's 40 years of judgment. Then they will all be wiped out at the end of that time. So you should by no means in the, into the land, which I swore I would make you dwell in, but your little ones, verse 31, whom you said would be victims. I will bring them in and they shall know the land, which you have despised. That's one reason why Jesus says, unless you become like these little ones, you'll in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the little ones entered into the new promised land. The, the elders who thought they knew everything, they were wiped out. When Jesus says, except you become like these little ones, you won't enter in. Just like only the little ones enter. And they knew what he was talking about because they read the Bible. Oh, yeah, the little ones are the ones who got to enter into the promised land. Jesus says, you won't enter into the kingdom unless you become like these little ones because they were believers. The little ones believed. It was the older ones who thought, oh, we're not going to listen to them. But Yeshua, he became the leader of the little ones who entered in. Yeshua is standing there. Jesus is standing there now. He says, but your sons will be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years, and they'll bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. Then the punishment will be over, that 40-year period will be over, and then I'll have my new people go in. So it's 80-30. Jesus is preaching to them, and he's trying to explain judgment is coming. It will be 40 years, just like it was during that time when they rejected Moses. But I'm going to have a new kingdom at the end of that time in AD 70. In fact, he says, if you're in Jerusalem, flee. If you're in the cities, flee because that 40 year judgment is coming on you. But I will have a new kingdom. I believe in new people with new believers. And unless you become like the little ones, you won't enter into my new kingdom. Luke 21, 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that his desolation is near. And in 67 AD, Jerusalem was sound, surrounded by General Titus, who later became an emperor. He, Jerusalem was surrounded, and people began to flee. No, only the believers fled. The others stayed there crazily, the real zealous one, and tried to fight the Romans. And, of course, they were slaughtered. And Jesus warned them. But only the little ones believed, only the... Little, young in heart, believed and fled and escaped. And then from that moment on, the gospel spread. But God's judgment came on Jerusalem. So it starts with this 40 year, this 40 day temptation of Jesus, which we're going to get into next week. This 40 year temptation, I mean, 40 day temptation, this 40 day of testing. These 40 days of testing of Jesus is a sign. Okay, it's starting again. Moses was in the mountain 40 days, getting the war, getting the word. He got the word 40 days. He came down. You guys messed up. He was in it for 40 days. And you guys atone for your sin. But sure enough, when Moses led you directly from that time period, directly after that 40 days, of repentance he led you to the mountain you wouldn't listen you rejected what moses said you rejected what yeshua said yeshua came back and said please don't listen to these naysayers please go in god is going to lead us in it says no nope, we won't listen yeshua got to go in the little ones got to go in but there was a 40-year judgment but it began with that 40 days of testing so Jesus is going through 40 days of testing in the wilderness, and they're supposed to go, ooh, 40 days in the mountain being tested. In the mountain being tested like Moses was in the mountain 40 days. Maybe we should listen. And God's repeating things so that they'll recognize it. This is that. This is that thing. Please recognize this is that same thing when it's 40 days of testing, judgment. 40 days of testing, judgment goes with it. 40 days of testing, there's judgment. 40 days Noah and the ark, there was judgment on everybody. And God says, I'm starting over with these new people. 40 days, 40 days. 
so Jesus is going into the wilderness for 40 days. It's a specific number that's supposed to resonate with the people when they read the story. Ooh, 40 days in the mountain, 40 days of testing. That's just like Moses. That's just like this. That's just like that. Yes. So is judgment coming? Yes. All right. So I'm going to stop there. We're going to go over the specific temptations because it wasn't just stuff that the devil made up. You know what? I think I have to, I'm a tempt him with wearing wool on uh, Thursday. There, there are specific temptations uh, that are introduced that have specific meanings for us. These are the these are the three ways that the devil that we are tested. There are three specific ways that we are tested. Anyway, you'll see when we get there next week. So thank you so much for listening. And um, uh, on Sundays, I'm in the book of Leviticus where God's giving this law that they're supposed to take in and then take it and go directly to the promised land. But as we know, they didn't. They messed up. So in Leviticus, we're getting the law. And in Numbers, we're going to see how they messed up. Leviticus, we get the law. Numbers, when we get to the book of Numbers, if you're all still alive, it's like it takes so long. We'll see how they messed up. Uh, and then Deuteronomy is a preparation for crossing over. Okay, so again, thank you so much for tuning in. Too much information. I will uh, see some of you next week, and others I'll see you on, on this Sunday. All right, thanks a lot. How do I save and end live video? Bye-bye.